In the middle of the 20th century, many composers wrote music that was completely incomprehensible to the general public. Why? And more interestingly, how? Well, I'm the Classical Nerd, and today we're talking about serialism. To understand serialism, one must first understand its immediate predecessors in the form of the Second Viennese School of Arnold Schoenberg, Alban Berg, and Anton von Webern. Schoenberg, who taught the other two, believed that the ever-increasing ambiguity of Western music was a precipitous slide towards a complete and total lack of key, so he became one of the first composers to write freely atonal music. However, he soon came to realize that it was actually really, really, really difficult to write freely atonal music because our brains are capable of perceiving tonal relationships in the most atonal of pieces. And so he thought that there needed to be a fundamental guiding principle behind atonal music, much as keys had become the guiding principle for tonal music. It was something through which to orient yourself if you're trying to not just listen to it, but write it in the first place. Out of this came the 12-tone technique, where the composer would choose which order every single note of the chromatic scale came in, in something called a tone row. Composers were limited because you could only drive forward through the row, and any iteration of it. The idea is that composers would use these rows in series and construct chords from them, but they would always be heard in succession, i.e. right to left. And that would mean that every note is used equally, and no one note gets one share of the glory, and thus no note was heard as the tonic. You could hear no tonal motion in a 12-tone piece because, well, if every note was played the same, you really could never tell which was supposed to be home and which was supposed to be away from home. In the 12-tone technique, composers were a little bit stymied in which note they could choose next. It was all based around the row, and... A lot of your composition of the row depended on what note you hadn't used yet. But they were very, very adept at manipulating the tone row itself and using the tone row as a building block, not just in its form, but also three other forms. Inversion, retrograde, and retrograde inversion. Inversion is probably the most complex of any of this, and it involves something called intervallic equivalency, which states that an interval going up is the same as an interval going down. Shorn from a tonal context, a major third going up is going to be the same thing as a major third going down. C going up to E is going to be the same as C going to A flat. So when you invert a row, all you're doing is saying that every interval that's going up is now an interval that's going down. The notes themselves are different. Then if you run it in retrograde, you get retrograde inversion, and then obviously retrograde is just you run the initial row backwards. The initial row in this is called the prime. But just by using two simple techniques combined with the original, you can have four unique tone rows that are based off of one single row idea. With these four rows, which is really just the same row, at a composer's disposal, actually going in and analyzing a 12-tone piece is one of the most fun musical challenges you can undertake. But if looking at the row is the equivalent of the big picture, to get really into the meaty details of which intervals are used and which intervals are grouped together within the row itself, you have to use something called set theory, which is a term borrowed from mathematics. But don't worry, in this context, it basically just amounts to counting. Let's take the first three notes of the row, D, E flat, and A flat. I chose these as an example because they constitute something called the Viennese trichord, which is a collection of three notes that, when sounded together, is quite dissonant. It was favored by Viennese composers because of this spiky dissonance. To use set theory, you have to group the 12 note row usually into either four groups of three or three groups of four. It really works out that way and you can understand the similarities in the interval qualities within the row itself and how the end might relate to the beginning and vice versa. So if you look at this row, D is exactly zero half steps away from D, so we start with zero. Don't ask me why we do this, it's just something that's done. Then E flat is one half step away from D, so that's a one, and then the A flat is six half steps away from D, which is a six. 
There are many other principles to actually grouping these together with set theory, but suffice it to say that this is another way to look at these groups. Collectively, this set is a 0, 1, 6, and any other group of notes that contains both a minor second and a tritone away from the initial starting note is going to be a 0, 1, 6 set. You can apply this to really any set. You can actually apply this to even tonal music, even though it really doesn't make sense in that context. And again, I want to make it clear that analyzing music through set theory is a whole video series unto itself. It's not really something that should be covered in a video that goes deep into serialism. So I'm going to leave it at that for now. It is important, however, to have that background information so we get to know serialism a little bit more broadly. Now let's take a look at some of the cultural context behind what this movement actually was about. Serial techniques were an outgrowth not of the entire Second Viennese school, but rather just of Anton von Webern, who wrote some of the shortest and most pointillistic abstract pieces of music ever committed to paper because he took Schoenberg's theories to heart and applied them and developed them with great rigor. He was shot and killed at the end of World War II by a trigger-happy American soldier who was looking for one of Webern's relatives, who was active on the black market. With the fractured blocks of East and West defining the post-war world, Western composers latched on to Webern, and there are several important reasons why. The first of which was that the Soviets were artistically very conservative. Stalin pushed an artistic agenda he called Soviet realism which stated that all music had to be for the masses and understandable, which basically meant that it had to be understandable to him, and his tastes were not on the avant-garde. If he or any of his top cronies didn't like it, they'd call it formalist, and they'd punish the artist. Shostakovich rightfully feared for his life during this period. Because of the censorship during the Stalin era, Russian music had to be diatonic, and it had to be Russian patriotic, and it had to be basically Communist Party propaganda and many composers were happy to oblige because it meant that they were going to survive to see another year. It wasn't just a step back from the kinds of musical advancements in the West before the Russian Revolution, but it actually was a step back from Russian music before the Stalin era. Lenin was actually quite fond of avant-garde music that pushed the envelope as long as it expressed something about the proletariat. The second is that Webern's early death was something of a lost hope. Many composers who were absolutely thrilled by the massive upheaval in Western music promised by the 12-tone technique and its variations as developed by Webern saw Webern as akin to some kind of prophet. Though Schoenberg invented the principle, it was Webern who refined it and perfected it. Much as in the so-called first Viennese school, Haydn invented all the forms, but it was Mozart who went on to refine and perfect those forms. Expanding the 12-tone technique to other areas of music was something he was only beginning to do, and many other composers felt like they needed to take up that mantle. They needed to pick up the torch. Third, Romanticism was dead. The carnage of World War I very nearly killed it, but it was World War II and the development of atomic weapons that signaled to the entire world, and thus to artists, that we were living in different times, qualitatively different times, that required a different outlook on life. With the death of Richard Strauss in late 1949, that was the last nail in the coffin for Romanticism. The post-war composers who took after Webern began to apply the principles of ordered sets to musical values other than pitch. Ordered rows and set theory began to crop up in the fields of orchestration and of rhythm and of tempo and really every single musical parameter you can think of. Olivier Messiaen was amongst the first to do this, when he did so with rhythmic values, but soon you began to see a total takeover of using ordered sets in these sorts of ways. Because all of the values were determined by predetermined series, using these became collectively known as serialism, i.e. using series. In the 1950s, Pierre Boulez began writing music that he called total serialism, where every single aspect of the music was determined before any note was written down as a function of a pre-composed series. All the work was done before any pen was set to paper, and then the piece basically wrote itself from that point on. From there on out, Boulez, who was a staunch serialist enough to the point that he actually organized clacks to boo Stravinsky pieces that weren't serialist enough, realized that, you know, maybe this whole total serialism thing is a bit, you know, limiting. You think? <laughs> 
Boulez could have chosen any number of wildly differing series, and the resulting piece wouldn't have been that aesthetically dissimilar from what did result. Later in life, Boulez would even go as far as to say that maybe writing 12 tone rows wasn't necessary at all. You could get away with an 11 note row or a 13 note row, which would mean skipping a note or <gasps> repeating one. Absolutely unthinkable to the younger Boulez. Serialism was the principle, in part due to the outsized influence of the major figures, who were also not necessarily the nicest people. Boulez even objected to the concept of octave doubling in orchestrational terms, seeing it as a violation of serialist philosophy. Notwithstanding the fact that octave doubling had been used by composers not to just add another line, which would have been parallel octaves, but rather just to add a fresh color, a fresh sound, or to reinforce a particular line in an atonal quagmire of an orchestra piece. Oftentimes, composers of the Second Vini School would write an H, which stood for Hauptstimme, which told the players which voice was the most important. If you use octave doubling, it makes that stand out a little easier, and makes the conductor be able to follow along the score a little bit easier, and makes the listener able to hear it a little bit easier. And Boulez was not a fan of this, partially because he had one of the greatest ears of all time, and he was thus a phenomenal conductor. I said that weird. Phenomenal. But you gotta give him credit in that he held himself to the same standard, and as a result, there are very few Boulez pieces and he would often tinker with them for the rest of his life. They're impeccably orchestrated not just because of his ear, but also because he had to find ways around what he and only he saw as a serialist infraction. Figures like Karlheinz Stockhausen applied some of these same principles to the world of electronic music, where he was one of the founding figures, although he was not without controversy himself. And Igor Stravinsky, in the third and final period of his career, decided to embrace serialism, although he always made sure he carved out a couple of exceptions for himself, so he would always retain that classic Stravinsky sound. All this being said, within a decade of World War II's conclusion, serialism and its supporters had taken over musical academia and all serious musical circles to the point that any composer who was not interested in the system due to its profound limitations was considered a bit of an outcast. If non-serialist composers were known at all to the serialist mainstream, they were either derided as derivative or appealing to a popular style unthinkable. The end result, as you might imagine, is that serialism more or less stalled out. With no place to go beyond the total serialism of Boulez's structures, which turned out to be a dead end in its own right, everything was by definition downhill from there, and composers who really wished to have their own language amidst many composers who were writing in the same style had to make exceptions for themselves, had to break the rules in some way in order to make themselves known amidst a sea of Boulez imitators. Ironically, what had begun, and what was encouraged by the West, as a backlash against the musical ethos of communism became itself musical communism. The most interesting voices of the mid-century either embraced serialism halfway, as Stravinsky did, or the Italian composer Luigi della Piccola, took things further but in another direction, such as the technologically aided compositions of Yanis Zanakis, or completely avoided the question altogether, like John Cage, Laurent Young, Georgie Ligeti, or Leonard Bernstein, who all wrote very different pieces from each other. Even with Boulez, the only reason he stood out amongst a crowd of serialists was his aforementioned mastery of instrumentation and orchestration aided by his great ear. There were, of course, still many exceptions to the hard-lined serialist fundamentalist school as embodied in Boulez. Take, for instance, Milton Babbitt. Despite writing a paper controversially titled Who Cares If You Listen, where he compared academic composers to research scientists and thought that they should be funded much in the same way for their research, he still went up to bat for his students who continued to write tonal music, which was unheard of in that era. You gotta understand that this was a time when students were told that if they were lucky, they might be able to get away with writing a major third every now and again. Now, I'm serious. That was actually told to students. Babbitt was far removed from the tonal world. In fact, he was just about as serialist as they got, but he understood on some level that serialism needn't be the only way forward, something that folks like Boulez just didn't get. By the 1970s, the backlash was really kicking into high gear. In then and in the decades to come, minimalist composers would cluster themselves around writing long and relentlessly tonal music, 
making sure that their musical processes were actually audible, as opposed to the serialists whose musical processes might be very interesting and very difficult to get your head around mathematically, but just weren't audible. Composers like Anihani Ratavara, Alfred Schnittke, Heinrich Gareski and the aforementioned Georgi Ligeti all flirted with serialism early in their careers but came to abandon it to pursue their own unique musical styles. Even Kirzhestov Pindareski, composer of some of the densest and least understandable string orchestra pieces of all time, said that music history needed to go back to Mahler and restart from there. The implication is that something along the way had uh, soured in the fridge, if you know what I mean. Nowadays you'd be hard pressed to find a serialist composer. As minimalism took over, and then post-minimalism, and now new complexity, and now new simplicity. It's really fractured the musical world since its downfall. But it's also changed the modern history of music in profound ways, and we're still not entirely sure of its effects. It began a trend where for several decades the only popular modern classical music was relegated to the film score. The film score became the last bastion of a neo-romanticism that is still embodied in characters like John Williams and Danny Elfman. Again, I want to make this clear. It's not the principle itself, which is actually really fascinating and applies math to music in profound ways. It's the fact that there were so many composers who were dead set on making it absolutely 100% the only way forward for anyone else, and they very nearly killed classical music as we know it. It is indelibly linked to a time of music history where the reach of composers vastly diminished and orchestras stopped playing so many new pieces in favor of rehashing old favorites because the new pieces were often widely reviled. And they were reviled because they didn't understand the serialists and where they were coming from. The serialists had gotten so into the myriad complexities of their own system that they forgot that there is an audience out there who was at least expecting something interesting, even if it's not something that they actually enjoyed. Instead, they heard a lot of things that sounded very similar, and stuff that didn't sound really good at all or even remotely interesting to their ears. The difficult position of classical music standing in the modern cultural zeitgeist can, in part, be blamed on this intentional avoidance of accessibility. It's not that the works were inaccessible. It was rather that the inaccessibility was prized in the name of moving things around and creating interesting patterns and mathematical constructs within the score. There was less emphasis on expressivity as a result. It was all about how interesting you could make the patterns within the notated music itself. It was more about the notation than actually being able to get performed. Not only were these pieces not really wanted by the larger classical music audience, but they were also not really things that could necessarily be played by every orchestra. A lot of composers realized that in order to really push the envelope, they needed to write music that was extremely difficult on top of not really being stuff that people wanted to hear. It is without a doubt a fascinating system, and elements of it still are around in modern scores. But I think it is a good thing for music history that the grip of the serialists on musical academicism has long since been broken. We're just now sort of dealing with the aftermath.